Mo friends, last time we built this Puma from Ryefield model in 135th scale. If you want to see how I created the anti-slip surface on the hull, or how I soldered the metal slat armor on its back, go check it out. But now, with the construction out of the way, we can have a good time painting, weathering, and adding Euro palettes. Bruh. But first things first. I said in the previous video that I don't like to work with too many subassemblies, and as such, I assembled this model in a way that only the tracks and the turret are removable for easier painting. The slat remains in place for the whole journey, except this panel, because I need to add an armored window behind it. Also, this movable section will ease things up a bit. The model collected a lot of grease, residue from soldering fluids, and dust, especially when it was left sitting on the workbench for a week while I was enjoying my holiday in Jordan. In other words, a thorough wash in soapy water is extremely essential. I was very hyped to start painting, but water takes a while to evaporate, so I used a cooling fan. It might seem like a silly idea or something that's not very effective, but it really makes a huge difference. Then I attached it to the Octopus M2M painting stand. Because of it, I won't have to physically touch the model until it's finished, which is very important when there are so many things that can be broken. The turret gave me a major bra moment because the bottom was solid and I couldn't clamp it into the turret jig. My solution was to drill a hole and insert a few toothpicks. And just like that, we're ready for painting. It's good to invest some time into these preparation steps because you'll collect the benefits for the rest of the project. Now we're going to do some basic spraying, and that calls for a basic airbrush. Fengda BD-130 with a 0.3 nozzle. Not so long ago I received a few goodies from Modeler's World and discovered some products that I never thought I'd enjoy or physically need. One of these hidden gems is Model Degreaser, and it makes a world of difference in paint adhesion. Especially on resin figures, it's a night and day difference. Next up is Metal Prep from VMS, a clear primer designed for metal parts, and although I've been using it for quite a long time now, it's also high up there in my important tool list. It saves you time and nerves because you won't experience any paint flaking on metal parts. And one of the biggest surprises for me was this Total Cleaner. It's the strongest stuff I ever used, but it really, like, really works. Anyway, all of these steps were pretty much invisible to the naked eye, but now we're finally starting to transform the model. Because, you see, Mr. Surfacer is also just a primer, but at the same time, it's not. It's one thing to unify the surface and give every material and texture on the model the same satin finish. Something that will greatly improve your paint job, but also the black primer is an important component of my painting approach. I always use a dark base, either completely black or very dark brown for my finishes because it helps to post shade the model and creates fake shadows in hard to reach areas. As such, it's good to be meticulous with its application and make sure you really spread it into every crevice. A decent priming session can take more than an hour, but it's a time well spent. It's also incredibly rewarding to observe the model in this uniform finish because all the textures suddenly pop out. It's a stage in the life of a model that I really enjoy. And now, let's give it some color, using the NATO camouflage set from AK Real Color range, with a bit of gloss varnish mixed into each one. The base color, Nado Green, is a fun one to apply, because it's the first layer, so we can enjoy the benefits of the black primer and apply it in a cloudy, uneven, semi-translucent layer. With this approach, we can create the initial shading, establish volumes, stress out the shape of the vehicle, and let's not forget the slightly mottled appearance that adds to the visual interest. Real Pumas are quite pristine when it comes to paint fading or damage, so we can use these subtle creative choices to make it look more interesting. This can be done rather quickly and the big airbrush is good enough for it, but now we need to take a more meticulous approach and study reference images carefully. 
Also, a delicate airbrush such as the BD-180 with a 0.2 nozzle will be needed. I haven't painted a NATO camouflage since... ever. <laughs> but I've read somewhere that these patterns are standardized, which means the layout of the camouflage is projected on the vehicle in the factory, each patch is outlined and then filled in with a spray gun. Also, the pattern is unique for each type of vehicle, so you'll find a different layout on a Leopard, for example. However, after looking at the references, there is some slight variation on different Pumas, but it's not significant. Because of that, I first made an outline of each patch while looking at reference images of the vehicle from each side, and then simply filled them in. That's the fun and easy part. Also, although the paint job is of high quality, it's not done by professional airbrush artists. So if you look closely enough on the real vehicle, you'll see some imperfections here and there. But I didn't take that as an excuse to do a poor job, not at all. I tried to spray it as best as I could. Also, the clear gloss that I add into each paint is just for better flow and saturation, so the model doesn't become darker once I seal it all with a flat varnish. So that's the basic layout with AK Real Colors. If you'd like to try them out or any of the weathering products that I'm gonna use in this video, you can visit their store through my affiliate link and use my promo code to get a discount on your order. And you'll find all the information in the video description. Now we're gonna post shade the model using the same paints, but we'll be making them lighter with buff from Tamiya. I made a couple of post shaded camouflages in the past, and the ones with soft edges are not the easiest. So I knew that this wouldn't be exactly a walk in the park, but in the end, it was actually quite fun. First of all, I only focused on applying highlights from above, usually in two or three layers each one lighter than the previous one, and covering a smaller area. That's the gist of the technique, but let's now talk about why it's not as hard as one might think. You see, the paint is really diluted, so it makes just a small difference if you make a single pass with the airbrush. Because of this, you don't have to be worried about accidentally spraying light green into a patch of black or brown. Also, using the buff color for every part of the camouflage gives the highlights a more unified look, so that helps too. There's also the fact that if there was some overspray or sputtering during the initial camo layout, these steps will fix all of it. Lastly, and this might be subjective, but you really don't need to worry about stepping out of each camouflage patch. The paint job looks much better and more natural when you go this route, as it looks kinda softer, you know? It's a much more pleasing look than the checkerboard finish you'd achieve if you stayed inside the boundaries of each patch, which would then create that distinct dark outline around everything. A field applied camo can be shaded separately. First you treat the base coat and then you block in and post shade the camouflage. It'll enhance that field applied look, but again, because this one is applied at the factory, that unified, soft appearance works really well. So here's what it looks like. I don't know, but <laughs> this artificial 3D rendered look fits the modern theme on this one, don't you think? At this point, I'd be eager to bring out the enamels and start withering and all that fun stuff, but we actually have a lot of work before we get there. First of all, decals. They're actually pretty good. Not even close to Tamiya or Mink in terms of how thin they are, but they're not thick, stiff planks from Tacom either. The only place where I needed a decal setting solution was the turret, and after a bit of hammering with a stiff brush, they traced the slightly textured surface of the model. Now I could seal the entire model with a few generous coats of VMS flat varnish. This is my go-to procedure on all my models, but modern tanks are especially flat. So, yeah, that's a small plus. <laughs> it's actually my favorite varnish of all time, and if you'd like to try out some VMS products yourself, I have a discount code for you, once again, in the video description. Some of the final missing details were the clear parts that I kept separate, so I could airbrush them with clear paints. The bulletproof window with a mixture of clear green and blue, and the siren light with orange, mixed with clear yellow and clear red. 
I don't work with clear parts very often because my main bread and butter is armor, but I found that using clear varnish to hold these in place works really well. Of course, these had to be attached after I sealed the model with a flat coat. Okay, and the last bit of airbrushing for a good while happens on the tracks. I started by painting them with German grey, which is a nice universal steel color, and then gave them an uneven coat of flat brown, which gives them a slightly corroded look. But it's just a base coat, so don't worry. And although I'm putting the airbrush aside for now, the model still isn't ready for enamel treatment. Some brushwork with acrylics is needed before that. You see, the rubber mats that supposedly work as bomb protection seem like they've been originally painted green, but the paint tends to peel off rather quickly. I'm trying to replicate what I saw in reference images as best as possible, so I started by painting them completely green and I chose a different color than the base coat on purpose to distinguish them a little. The rest is about dry brushing and stippling with grayish tones that will replicate the rubber. I've read about this part on modeling forums where people were suggesting that the mats are black, but references just don't lie. <laughs> Remnants of green paint are clearly visible there. It's a cool and unique surface that adds so much variety to this model. And here we have it, all base coated up and ready for some good enamel treatment and other fun things. It's become my standard routine to start with a pin wash, and for this model I chose dark brown for green vehicles from AK. And I'm gonna be using Manger's White Spirit for blending. Some surfaces are great for pin washing, others not so great. Smooth areas with deep panel lines and sharply defined details are absolute heaven for this technique and it's the best therapy for me. I often listen to podcasts or even watch a movie with my peripheral vision while applying a pin wash. Other surfaces, such as the German Zimmerit on World War II tanks, make this job more difficult. And modern anti-slip surfaces are the absolute worst, because they soak up it like a sponge, not only dragging it away from the details, but also becoming unnaturally dark. Precise application and swift blending is the key here, but there are a few more tricks that we'll get to. Another thing that I wanted to talk about is that AK has a dedicated wash for NATO camouflage, but it's almost black, and if you have a pale, post-shaded surface like I do right here, it would be just too dark for our purposes. In other words, you don't have to take it as a rule if the label says something. It's more of a suggestion. Lastly, flat surfaces give the paint a nice grippy surface, but the downside is the wash bites into the surface really fast. So it's best to work in small sections and start blending right after the wash is dry to the touch. Which means when it's not glossy anymore. Some people prefer oils over enamels. And I like to use both. It's just a matter of how I feel that day. The gravelly surface was a great place to use some thick oils because they won't get absorbed like the thin enamel wash. It's much easier to blend these and keep them exactly where you want them without turning the upper surfaces of the puma into a dark hunk of coal. Note how the pin wash toned down the artificial look of the post shading, and actually, for a well kept clean NATO vehicle, this is almost a perfect look in my opinion. So if you like your models clean, this is certainly a way to go. But some of these small details became a bit dark thanks to this technique. It's a matter of personal taste, but I like to bring them out with a much lighter color. It's even more unnatural than heavy post shading and it's even easier to overdo, so I recommend using a very diluted paint and rather build the opacity slowly. It's one of those techniques that looks very unnatural on its own, but with every other weathering technique in place, it'll actually create a very nice and balanced finish. I guess it also brought back that 3D rendered modern look I was so hyped about, right? Normally it would be now the best time to start adding chipping and rust effects, but these vehicles are so pristine that I didn't even bother and jumped right into detail painting. There can be a lot of tiny details on modern armor that need to be painted in all kinds of different paints, and it would be a very long list if I wanted to mention them all. So my suggestion instead is this. 
get a variety of grays, silver metallics, clear reds, blues, greens, yellows, and so on. And also all of these less common vivid paints that we don't need often on armor models, such as standard yellow, red, blue, even turquoise. And a ton of patience, because some of these are not as easy to paint. You might encounter reflective surfaces, back view mirrors, periscopes, camera optics, rubber, polished steel, you know, all kinds of stuff. It's definitely worth looking at references closely because you never know what hidden gem you might find, such as this vivid tape that's wrapped around the electric and data cables in the back that I just painted on. Okay, at this point it looks like a proper clean puma from a military expo, and I could start adding some earth effects, but you know what? I desperately wanted to add some minimalistic chipping, so I scanned the reference images under a microscope and found some. I don't know much about pumas. After all, many of you called me out on my BS in the previous video where I was claiming that it's still a prototype. Yeah, that's what happens when you watch one YouTube video about the puma and think you're an expert. But what I'm trying to say is that I don't know what material the puma is made of. The armor must be steel and some composite material underneath, but the additional armor kit could be aluminum for all I know. However, references show shiny metallic chips everywhere, so maybe even the steel itself has some alloy that gives it a very shiny appearance. That's why I painted everything with aluminum acrylic paint. The only area with more of that traditional night shift approach is the towing cable. After all, these get beaten up pretty badly, so here I added a ton of chips and some generous rust effects with oil paints. Before I could start the modification process, there was one teeny tiny detail that I wanted to add. Vehicles during military exercises have all kinds of temporary markings, and some of them are made from pale blue or silver tape. Modern armor allows you to play around with these colorful additions, and it's worth making the most out of them on your model. At least in my opinion, of course. And with that, the Puma is all painted up and ready for mod. Did I mention that the kit doesn't come with a photo etched mesh for the engine air intake? Nor does it come in the Voyager aftermarket set. It's not cool, I don't like it at all, but as I'm narrating this with the model already finished, I totally forgot about that part, so in the end, I guess it's not that bad. But okay, mud effects. Modern tanks always fascinated me for their ability to get muddy right up to the commander's hatch. When we're building historical tanks, we often have to keep in mind their top speed and how that would affect the mud distribution. Also, their shape plays a huge role in this and how their mud guards are designed. There are a lot of different factors. But it seems to me that no matter how hidden the running gear on a modern tank is, mud just gets splashed absolutely everywhere. And the reason for that is speed. These vehicles are fast, and when they fly across a muddy field, that stuff splashes just everywhere. Anyway, I used the standard approach that I developed over the years to keep this otherwise daunting step as straightforward and controllable as possible. I stippled small amounts of AK terrain space on the lower surfaces, according to reference images, and then applied a coat of pre-dusting with an airbrush and diluted buff from Tamiya. This paint softens the harsh edges of the dry acrylic paste and creates a subtle foundation or a roadmap of sorts for enamel weathering. Even if the tank is gonna be covered in sloppy mud, it's always best to start with a coat of dry earth effects. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but as I said, it's a start. Our aim is to achieve something along these lines. Now that looks much more exciting, doesn't it? The key is to know where to be subtle and where it's appropriate to be heavy-handed. The first coat builds upon the layer of pre-dusting and adds fineness and some greedy texture. Once again, there is a dedicated product called Rainmarks for NATO tanks, but I find it too pale and desaturated. Africa dust effects are warmer and create a more harmonious finish over the three-tone NATO camouflage. 
Brushing the paint onto the surface and then swiping it up and down with the flat paintbrush is a very powerful technique on vertical or slanted surfaces. But what I find even more exciting is combining speckling and swiping. Because specks give you a lot of visual texture and simulate the splashed mud perfectly. But when you blend them with the swiping motion, not only do you get rid of some of the excessive or overly large specks, but you create even more random and exciting streaks of dried mud. And the best thing, you can build this effect up in layers and don't need to wait for the previous one to dry, because the flat surface makes them rock hard really fast. It's not so fun on the anti-slip surface, but then again, nothing is fun here. <laughs> Except when you're creating it, as seen in the previous episode. But also, in real life, this is pretty much how dirt looks on this type of surface. It's just dull, so why not, you know? <laughs> and as I said, mud gets everywhere, so I gave the turret a very subtle speckling and streaking treatment as well. The effect gives the otherwise smooth-looking paint job a grittier, more interesting facade. With the dry tones finished, we can switch to a darker paint and simulate the damp, fresh mud. This is one of the reasons why I enjoy painting mud effects in individual layers. The dry and wet tones work together so well and it's so easy to create an authentic looking effect. Let me get back to what I said about mud on historical tanks for a while. I felt a bit guilty as I was weathering the puma because when my patrons send me photos of their models for constructive criticism, one thing that I point out very often is the splashed mud in areas where it shouldn't get in such quantities. For example, the side skirt slash mud guards on a king tiger. Yet here I'm doing the very same thing. But then again, reference images don't lie, you know? Pumas get absolutely covered in mud in the lower areas, and the upper sides get their fair amount of mud splashes as well. It's all about the high speed of these vehicles compared to World War II armor. But also, they perform military exercises in much harsher conditions. We're talking like knee-high mud, deep ruts and puddles, and speeds around 50 km per hour. The type of terrain where historical tanks wouldn't even dare to go, you know? So, basically, this second layer is the same ordeal as the previous one, but the key is to apply it without overpowering or completely covering up the dry tones. Another cool thing about modern tanks is when dirty water starts seeping through the gaps in the additional armor kit, and when the tank is driving fast, it creates these angled streaks. Okay, I haven't seen it on a Puma, but it's often visible on Israeli Merkavas. The tracks were painted using the same methods, but because they're tracks, there are some nuances. For example, when I was done with pre-dusting, I painted the outer rubber pads with a flat paintbrush, and also the inner polished steel surfaces that came into contact with the wheels. Then I slapped the enamel paints on top of that, did some blending, speckling, more blending, wiped the mud off the contact points, and the tracks were done. Not much of them is visible anyway, but they are a crucial part of every armor model, so it's good to give them the same attention. At this point, the Puma is pretty much finished, but I wouldn't even choose this subject if it wasn't for the unique urban camouflage made from old Euro palettes. It's easy to find dimensions and blueprints on Google and then just divide all dimensions by 35 to get into our scale. The main building materials are 2mm planks of balsa wood and 0.6mm oak veneer. I briefly considered making them from plastic, but wood is much quicker and offers better textures with less effort. The chopper from North Shore West Coast or whatever was an invaluable asset during this session, and before I knew it, I had enough material for 10 pallets and a few more planks and blocks to spare for future projects. I think there are several aftermarket offerings out there, and I think they're cast from resin, which might be a good alternative, but trust me when I say that building them yourself isn't as hard as it might seem. If you nail the dimensions, especially the thickness of the materials, the assembly is extremely straightforward, and it has two giant advantages in my opinion. You can build as many as you want without worrying that you bought yourself 
three resin palettes and now you have to use them wisely. And maybe even better, it's very satisfying to know that, yup, I did those myself. <laughs> That last statement works especially well on your non-modeling friends when they come over to visit you. Doesn't work on girls though. The best compliment I got for my woodworking effort was, there must be something very wrong with you. <laughs> but yeah, that's the gist of it. <laughs> it costs pretty much nothing, and you can waste a few hours of your life with it. I also made sure to take full advantage of the material and made plenty of broken pieces that can be seen on some vehicles during urban operations. They'll give the model a nice Mad Max vibe. Ok, time to paint them. I would usually spray them with a thick, deeply penetrating coat of Mr. Mahogany Primer, but I tried impregnating them with an enamel wash instead. To my surprise, this approach is much faster than airbrushing. And the results are, dare I say, better, because it gives us much more uneven undercoat and thus more authentic finish. The rest is performed completely with acrylic paints, and I chose several darker tones for the initial layer and an equal amount of light tones for the upper layer of wood grain. I combined them all between each other to achieve as much variety between each palette as possible, but basically I made several pieces that are greyish, desaturated and old, and the rest is more vivid and fresh. It's about patience and choosing the right colors, but let's not underestimate the importance of the dark undercoat, which helps us to emphasize the wood grain texture and also visually separate individual planks from each other, so it works like a pin wash. I also used a bunch of flesh tones, especially for those splintered planks with fresh, exposed wood underneath. That's basically the whole thing. I spent one afternoon assembling them and slightly more than that with painting. And here are the colors I used. These are the warm, vivid ones and here are the less saturated tones if you're interested in trying it yourself. They can be seen hanging off the sides of armored vehicles but also placed randomly on top of their hulls. It's hard to tell from photographs, but I'm betting they're hanging on either ropes or wires tied somewhere on the hull. Well, before I could start messing around with rope, I had to glue them in the desired position. And to keep everything as authentic as possible, I used German super glue. I'm not replicating a specific Puma, more like a collection of cool ideas taken from different vehicles, but keeping everything plausible. Case in point, I haven't found images of Pumas with pallets on top of the hull, but I've seen other vehicles. As long as they don't block the view from periscopes, I think it's perfectly reasonable. That's all pretty sweet, right? But what about the rope? Well, as luck would have it, not so long ago I found this braided fishing line in Tesco when I was grocery shopping, and I knew it would come in handy one day. I just didn't know it would be so soon. I'm very hesitant to use regular sewing strings because they're extremely fuzzy, and my favorite solution is to twist my own ropes from very thin wires, but doing it in such large amounts, not to mention on a painted model, would be nonsensical. This made my life infinitely easier, but I have to say, the rope texture isn't as crisp as with twisted wires, so it's harder to paint. But why make it so hard when this material absorbs enamel washes like a sponge? It's so awesome and does the job perfectly. And now I just need to carefully paint the fake braided texture with a pointy brush and a sandy acrylic paint. This is where it's not as easy because the shrink is rather flat. But it's a good painting exercise, that's for sure. <laughs> Once I was done, I was so happy with the model transformation that I wanted to consider it done. But the urban camo isn't complete unless we add some old racks, just like on the Regal vehicles. I don't know about you, but adding tarps to a finished model, not to mention painting them properly, doesn't sound that easy to my ears. Especially if they're sculpted from green stuff, hands down the best putty for this job. But did you know that you can change the color of the putty if you mix it with a bit of dry pigment? Just a dip in an old bottle of Adam Wilder's black pigment, and the tarps won't need the dark base coat. What makes this putty so awesome is the rubbery quality. It's very flexible and stretchable, and that means it's extremely easy to roll it so thin 
that the resulting pancake is thinner than printer paper. Putty tarps are easy to cut with a large knife, and adding realistic tears is also easy. This process stretches the putty even further, reducing its thickness and making it more realistic. I placed them randomly over the vehicle, following reference images for inspiration, and from what I've seen, there are usually strips of old tarps, sometimes even uniforms or sandbags. A little bit of tap water will clean the leftover powder and glue them to the model. Simple as that. Some of my dear patrons told me that this is a legit type of urban camouflage that's used by infantry as well. Soldiers basically attach rags, pieces of cardboard and random junk to their uniforms and when they lie down, you won't be able to distinguish them from the omnipresent junk in urban combat environments. I'm not sure how effective this camouflage is on huge armored vehicles, but it sure does look cool and it's something you don't see on models every day. It's funny because until this point I considered this model rather bland, without any personal touch of mine, but as I was finishing the tarps, I knew that the model was just waiting for this final step that gave it a more nighty shifty look. <laughs> anyway, here are the colors that I used for the racks, and each one was highlighted with light earth. It was an easy task because I wasn't worried about maximum contrast with the model. It's not stowage after all, it's camouflage. Anyway, let's wrap things up real quick. I had to blend everything together, and that meant adding small amounts of earth tones. Low hanging palettes received more mud, and some racks that were almost touching the ground got completely covered. A little bit of speckling will give them that nice greedy texture, and also break up the smooth comic book style of paint job that I love so much on tarps. The last detail that I forgot was adding soot on the exhaust pipe, and this was done with the same black pigment that I used with the green stuff putty. Alright, dear friends, that about wraps up the puma, or as I like to call it, trash panda. Let me know your thoughts about it, and if you saw this camouflage coming, because in the previous video I said something about how the model's shape is gonna be completely different because I was going to add something interesting to it. The only feedback I've got so far was on Patreon, and as I was painting the model, people were generally stoked about the progress, but as soon as I dropped a gallery with the palace attached, the consensus was like, oh, okay, that's um... That's interesting. <laughs> I guess a lot of people were surprised by this choice, and I can see why. It's such a weird type of camouflage, and it doesn't fit the super modern Puma at all. But that's what I love about it, and that's the reason I chose to build this model. It's weird, unusual, gritty, and contrasts so much with the clean, almost pristine look of the Puma. In other words, it's right up my alley because I love it when I can add a bit of creativity to my work. I'm gonna make a scenic base for it as well to give it some context, so keep an eye on that. In the meantime, I want to sincerely thank every single one of you for watching these videos, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be building models for a living, and I can't thank you enough for this amazing opportunity. All of this is also possible thanks to my incredible patrons. My whole Patreon page is like a Night Shift magazine subscription, as I post there almost every day with updates from my workbench. And actually, sometimes it's multiple times a day when I'm extra productive. Uh, but we can also get in touch through DMs, comments and emails. I'm posting one week early ad-free videos, and those stay there forever, so you can always get back to them without even keeping track of these official uploads on my channel. I also have some extra goodies such as 3D models which you can download and print for your own projects, a bunch of real-life references for nature, old buildings and so on, and last but not least, these high-resolution studio photos which show the model in more detail than video ever could. It would help me a lot, but hey, no pressure. Anyway, my friends, if the scenic base turns out nicely, this model might turn from something I didn't enjoy like extremely much, as was the case with Valentine, which is probably my favorite project ever, into a model that I'm really stoked about, and it was all because of the improvised urban camouflage. It just gave the super modern Puma a totally crazy and totally different look. 
Well, wish me luck with the scenery, and once this project is done, we're going back to World War II with a very ambitious diorama. In the meantime, stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!